want someone to tell me what to eat, what to like, what to hate, what to rage about, what to listen to, what band to like, what to buy tickets for, what to joke about, what not to joke about. I want someone to tell me what to believe in, who to vote for and who to love and how to tell them. I just think I want someone to tell me how to live my life, Father, because so far I think I've been getting it wrong. But I know that's why people want people like you in their lives. Because you just tell them how to do it. You just tell them what to do and what they'll get out at the end of it. Even though I don't believe your bullshit and I know that scientifically nothing that I do makes any difference in the end anyway, I'm still scared. Why am I still scared? So just tell me what to do. Just fucking tell me what to do, Father. Oh! This one will be mine. I belong to no one. Starting. We're recording. I like the idea of it being sort of like those uh, those Garfield comics without uh, Garfield. Oh that'd be, God, that'd be so you, funny, just dude. looking like you're mad, absolutely insane. <laughs> spine spine crackers without the crackers. Right. Dude, Wait sans, a minute. Yeah. That's uh, sounds a couple of them. Spine crackers without without Gabe and Matt. <laughs> just Paul. Yeah, the right. special one crack pod. <laughs> <laughs> Jimmy crack pod and I don't care. Ew. <laughs> yeah, no. What's up, folks? Hey, welcome to Spine Crackers. Hey. How's it going, everybody? Um, welcome to another episode of Spine Crackers. Uh I am Matthew, one of your hosts. I'm Hi, Gabe. Paul. Oh. oh God, we need to plan it out. <laughs> Someone needs to go. Uh I'm Paul, one of your hosts. I'm Gabe, and I'm also one of your hosts. And today we are discussing a pick that uh, was brought to you and us by Paul. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, Paul, if you'd like to uh, do the usual stuff. Yes, 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 yes. Well, I, I got this book uh, well, from a friend, basically. It was, it was on her top three list of 2020, and I wanted to branch out a little bit and just take someone else's recommendation. It's called uh, Luster by Raven Lilani, a 30-year-old... Arthur, mm-hmm. Arthur from uh, Brooklyn, I think, or the Bronx. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I don't I know where she's actually she... from. Like, because well, that's one thing. I don't know how, the degree to which this book is actually. I think like, she is actually from the Bronx. I think I Wikipedia that. There's some um, upstate New York love in this book, or hate. Yes. Yeah, hate, major hate. Yeah, which is sad. It's only a place where you can go to fucking have all of your spiritual, you know. Growth die. Keith Keith Ranieri is not doing us any favors in that <laughs> respect. No, that fucking that fucking oh my god. Yeah. He was so close to me too. Yeah, I know. He was close to all of us. Spoilers. Yeah. Who is that? Who is he's that not the guy a... who he's the guy who ran the, the Nexium cult. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. He lived like twenty minutes from where we grew up pretty much. Yeah, I knew a I knew a kid who like went to Nexium meetings. That's crazy. Yeah. yeah. He paid like five thousand dollars to go up to an apartment and I don't even know. Get what he branded. Did I think possibly. Just, I don't know what step he got to. Just saying Nexium gives me heartburn because it's also <laughs> a heartburn medication, which is hilarious to me. It's so funny. <laughs> all right. Sorry, Paul. That's yeah. Right. Raven Leilani. Yeah, Raven Leilani. Uh, but yeah, this is a book that my friend recommended to me, like I said. Um, Already distancing it, yourself from it. 
Uh, just a little bit, you know. <laughs> it wasn't dire- it wasn't a direct pick of mine. Right, right, right. That's you know, I, I didn't research. It was more like, okay, mm. she liked this book. Yeah. Well. His- History is going to record it as a direct pick of yours. <laughs> <laughs> what are you trying to say? I'm just saying. The, the, okay, it's my. I'm not. I'm not. Okay, it's my pick. It's, I picked it. I <laughs> picked you. it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. That's it. That's it was all. My pick this week. Yeah, I did it. It'd be. <laughs> um, but basically, it's about a a young woman in New York, living in New York City in her early twenties. I think she's twenty three. Her name is Eddie Edie. I can't, Edie, uh, Edie, but Edie. we don't find that out until later on in the book, right? Yeah, she's kind of unnamed most of the most mm-hmm. of the story. But uh, basically, she she's like kind of sad girl living uh, this Tinder lifestyle. She has kind of a okay job in some office. I forget exactly what she does, but she's um, she meets an. She works for a publishing company at the beginning. Oh yeah, yeah. Like the the children's division of a publishing company. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But basically, she meets an older man in his forties on Tinder, and uh, he's in an open marriage. Um, or at least he's allowed to see other people. I'm not sure if the wife is, but I think so. But uh, yeah, the, she ends up eventually weirdly living at their house for a while, uh, like a couple months. And they, uh, the couple, has like a an adopted black daughter. I, I should also say that the main character is black, um, which you know, there's a lot of race elements in this story, so it is important. But the daughter is uh, adopted, and she is black. Um, and she kind of forms a better bond with the uh, daughter and the wife by the end of the story. Um, and eventually, she gets like a she gets fired, and she gets a new job, and then she ends up moving out. That's kind of like the basic plot mm-hmm. elements. Um, yep. So, yeah, what are your guys' uh, first takes? Well, uh, I don't know how you guys feel about that, but I do think just it for some of our listeners who may not be into this kind of thing, this podcast will be three white men talking about a novel by and about largely black women. So right. um, yes. here, here we stand. We can do no other. Um, <laughs> that's just that's what's about to happen. So if you can't stomach that, which I, I uh, not would necessarily blame you, but bail bail abandon ship now. But this is also yes. our first real uh, tackling of like uh, a sort of contemporary. Like this is a fairly new book, and yeah. it's got a lot of buzz around it. I, I, we're a little late to the game, I think, a bit mm-hmm. on this one. But um, yeah, I, I don't, I don't know. It's I learned the the idea of uh, the fake ass genre of, of what's called millennial fiction. I didn't know this was like a, a thing that was demographically pigeonholed at the moment, but apparently. It started with Rebecca Nelson and, like, has been sort of regarded as its own sort of, uh, uh, like, subgenre of, of, yeah, dissolute uh, pe- young people drifting through life mm. pa- painfully without meaning. Writing books on LiveJournal and Tumblr, is that part of it, too? <laughs> yeah, n- well, I mean, definitely reference to, to social media and, like, mm-hmm. a more, like, stark frank just sort of, like, look at it. And, and, and also just, like, a, a <laughs> look way more... Way more of just like the assumption of its existence and stuff, you know what I mean? Like, there's a lot of assumptions of, of cultural touch points, which I think is purposeful mm-hmm. in the book, but there are a lot of them. A oh, lot. Well, uh, let me uh, segue into reading all the ones I wrote down real quick. Sure. You want you want to hear that? <laughs> you have, wait, you have a whole list. Of it's cultural not that long. reference points. Well, they're very millennial. This is how you know it's written by a millennial. Here we go. Uh, it, it's it's I wrote it's millennial catchphrase heaven. Uh, Helga Pataki, Tumblr, yep. Brooklyn, Zine, Chipotle, Namaste, Activated Charcoal, Lo-Fi, Forever 21, Tim Burton, Jolly Ranchers, The Matrix Reloaded. I uh, have another page here. Elmer's Glue, C- Captain Planet, Student Elmer's- Loans, Rocco's Modern Life, Comic-Con, Gundam, Jubling, and Power Rangers, which those were all in the same sentence. So Yes. <laughs> Paul, you're so you were probably got excited about the jeweling part. Oh yeah, I like that part a lot. I'm jeweling right now. <laughs> it became relatable for one word. Yes. Long. <laughs> well, I mean, this does touch on because Matt, you bring up that this is kind of like a feature of what gets called millennial fiction, which 
you know, I didn't know it was a genre. Until I had I had I heard the phrase, book. but I didn't know. Like I had heard the phrase before, but I didn't know that people were trying to like make it into like a full fledged like genre. You know what I mean? Like I I thought it was more of like just as a you you, you could use it to advert like adjectivally describe a single book or a, you know whatever. But I didn't know that there was right. supposed to be like a a movement or a genre or whatever. But you you know you mentioned that one of the things is like a sort of like self conscious. Um, inclusion of these kind of cultural touch points or these references or whatever from from millennial culture and it just took me back i actually think spoiler alert i think this book is in a like literarily re- reminded me quite a bit of submission by Holbeck yeah. that we read mm-hmm. last week or two weeks ago um right two weeks ago yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. and um no actually we, three weeks ago was Cause it? Weeks. Oh God, yeah, it was. Yeah, Holy cause, crap! Because that was my pick too. So yeah, yeah, you're right. Ago. Um, so, uh, and I, we can talk more about that. But one of the things that I said in that episode that bugged me, and I, and again, like I don't, I don't think this is like necessarily like a global or like a big deal in general, but was the inclusion of a bunch of like very very specific references to very very specific thought like things that Holbeck made that just kind of lost the punch even a few years later that they may have had when he was referencing them and so I wonder like what there is to say about that phenomenon in general is that a weak is that like an inherent weakness of writing if it's like rooted in a time and place in such a specific way like I I don't know I don't really know what I don't really know if I have considered opinions on it but this book kind of foregrounded that because that's like such a big part of of the way it sort of sh- describes and, and outlines its world. Well, I I've think... always had a problem with cu- with cultural references, even in like TV shows. Like, I, I'm a big fan. I'm a millennial also, so I'm a big fan of like The Office and Parks and Rec. And even in those shows, the you know, which are not amazing shows, but the, the cultural references in those shows become dated really quickly. Um, so I've always thought. It, it was a, a weakness to any form of art is like don't have too many in there if the, if they're in there i don't know make them make sure that they're like relatable across time maybe because i mean there, there just were there i mean you re, you listened to my list there were a lot and that was that's pretty short too them. yeah that's not that's less than half by a long shot yeah. uh um no i i think you're right I, I this is something that i mean like i took lit classes and college and stuff like this this was definitely something that was has remained and is an argument uh that just never ceases to you know i mean it's like you want to you want to evoke a a very particular time and place which i think in in the case of this book is something that raven leilani really wanted to to do i think she was really going hard with like the experiential like she this is so feverishly packed with references that it, it feels like she is trying to stuff like you know the experiential universe of a particular type of person at a particular time into one book um to the point where it's almost like yeah it's like feverish and and kind of uh, it becomes this like nonsense almost in certain moments and you know to to her credit i think i think that's all very intentional mm-hmm. like overload of cultural reference points and even if they age into meaninglessness over the next even 3 years it's like part of the point well and that's kind of that i guess that's the other thing that that i was thinking about like where (laughs) you know that description and you're right matt it's very like there are moments where it gets like stream of consciousness almost and it's just like one reference one thing after another after another after another um and i do think it was it was it was conscious and i think that like the part of the implicit commentary is that like that is the millennial experience. We basically have sort of become like aggregates of a few of like a bunch of cultural touchstones and, and fucking shit that we watched on Cartoon Network and like whatever, you know what I mean? Like that, that is the substance of millennial existence is just kind of like, like skipping across from fucking one cultural, cultural reference to another. And that's kind of, it i think that's part of the 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 point in some ways but 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 to your point paul i also think like because she does it so it comes so hard and fast for the entire book like she just lapses into the thing you're talking about as well which is like 
even now, this book came out, what, a year ago? Not even? Mm. Uh, you know, already cringe. Some of it's just weird to me, just like when you said Helga Bataki, right? The phrase was, her email had Helga Bataki vibes. Uh, yeah. I hate that. I hate that sentence. <laughs> and I think even within the context of the book, it kind of sucks. Uh, and there's a, it's, I, I say the ratio is favorable to intentional you know, uh, mon- mon- like psychedelic menagerie of cultural references, right. but she she does a de- it's like sixty forty then like uh, stuff where you're just like this was just bad from go. Yeah, there's definitely some that that are that get shoehorned in or forced in ways that feel less, uh, you know, less apt or less sort of like, you know that make less sense. And I think that's a good, that, that's a good example of one where it's just like, like did, 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 did you need this really? And, and I don't like, know. Do you think, um, so like she's talking to Eric, uh, the Who, guy, that's the, the, yeah. the 46 year old man with a family who's in an open marriage that she's pursuing. Uh, and in, in the, uh, in the early stages, uh, she describes him as in person, uh, as a total daddy. Do you think that's yeah. gonna hold hold water over time? <laughs> right. Like being being daddy being daddy AF. Fucking. <laughs> I forget who was the fuck. Who's that uh, tall, semi attractive comedian who's also like a socialist on Twitter and stuff? Uh, I'm not gonna remember his name. God damn it. She she what? said she mo- she said she literally like in her head she was thinking of this guy when she uh, was writing Eric. Oh damn! Now I want to know who it is. Yeah. Fuck, man. Uh, hold on, I'll look it up. You Not guys. like John Mulaney or somebody. It is John. Mulaney. John Mulaney. Okay. It is John Mulaney. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. So, I mean, uh, yeah, I could see that. I could see that as a model for for this character. I was actually picturing the guy who played Superman because I had just watched uh, Henry the Cavill. Cut. Yeah. <laughs> oh my god. Uh, he's cool. He's British. He he's is. also huge. Yeah, Jack. He, he's a huge gamer too. Jacked gamer, yeah, just building a, his own personal uh, gaming rig and yeah. playing D and D campaigns with Vin Diesel. <laughs> That's that is pretty Chad. That's cool f- life for him. Um, <laughs> Good for him. So, okay, so yeah, I think that's an interesting. That's another interesting <clears throat> example. Like, okay, daddy being daddy AF, and there's the, yeah, there's definitely. I think you, like you said, Matt, like the the it's on like there's ways in which the book is a victim. I don't know if it's a victim, right? Maybe again, this could all be intentional, right? That's the other thing. All sort of it, like it, 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 it could be a, a sort of version of like literary planned obsolescence, where, <laughs> which is like, of course, another feature of millennial life with all of our phones and every fucking mm-hmm. device we use. We True. know when we buy it, it's going to be completely useless in three years, basically. And, it, it'd be interesting to think about a book like this in that context where like there's all these things and these references that are on purpose going to be not, not current or sound goofy in a couple of years. And some of them I think already do like, that's one of them to me. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, do you think um, like the term millennial fiction, do you think that a part of that relates to the audience being like, should, millennial fiction only be directed towards millennial audiences because i mean i was just thinking about the audience for this book and it seems very very particular yep yeah like written for for a particular age group group um i think that if you're a young woman in new york city you probably got a lot out of this book Um, not to say that i didn't get anything out of it i think that as a white man i i definitely got a lot of uh like understanding and empathy for the main character. Um, So I'm not saying that you can't get anything out of this if you're not a millennial woman, but it did seem very limited. Like she was writing for one particular audience, a very niche audience. Yeah. We're all millennials as well. That's the other thing, right? It's like, I, I think what, what, what struck me as a little bit insidious about this categorization and, and this book, which I I will say, it feels like a genuine attempt to just describe the pain and horror mm-hmm. <laughs> of a of a situation. Yep. Is is that it? Still, in my mind, it, it cynically, just falls into uh, you know a, a publishing industry eager to capitalize on people just 
our age and thereabouts going, oh my God, life sucks in this particular way. That's so relatable. I enjoyed reading about that. And yeah. then, and then, yeah, it, it, it has no lasting power except maybe as a, a again, a, a document of it, but I don't know. I, I love the, Gabe, I like that you're talking about Huelbeck because it, it, I agree with you on that point that it's, it has more similarities than certainly Raven Leilani would probably, if I had to guess, <laughs> want. <laughs> like, you know, the people that like this book would probably be the people that would describe Quellbeck as completely anathema to even read. Mm -hmm. So I just find that interesting. That because I agree with you. Because I, I agree, I agree too. I think that out of all the books we've read, that this one relates to Quellbeck the most. So, and and yeah, you know, it's ob obviously obviously the book doesn't share Quellbeck's cultural politics in the way like, but no, like no. in terms of literarily, like it's basically kind of a, a similar thing where it's like a, a description of someone flailing around for in, in search of meaning that has been denied them by a, by a, a world that is, you know um, you know, in this book, uh, because obviously she's a black woman, more sort of like explicitly hostile in various ways rather right. than sort of the indifferent world that Welbeck paints for, for his, for his white male character. Right. Um, but you know, sort of flailing around. It's just, you know, people, people searching for meaning and behaving badly while doing it. And, you know, you know, <laughs> actually, sort of you know, the... I was just, it just made me think, you know what it is. It's, uh, the Edie, the main, the protagonist is more like a character that would have been one of these people that, and Eric is the Huelbeck character. Yes. Like, yeah. Eric is yeah, the guy totally. with like, you know, uh, liberal and, and vaguely progressive understandings who's educated, but has like, uh, unresolved uh, issues of sexual violence with women and, yes. and, and racist sort of like, you know, feelings that he has trouble grappling with. So it's like if the story were written about one of these people that a Hullabeck character fucked and, and ditched later, but it's like her perspective, basically. <laughs> yeah, that's actually a good yeah, way like to it put makes it. Me think of and the, she's just uh, doing just as bad in a lot of ways. <laughs> right. <laughs> like the girlfriend character in, in the Hullabeck story, I forget her name, but there, he, the main character was dating like a young... 22 year old miriam miriam yeah mm -hmm. it, it was like if a, bu a book was written about miriam's experience that's that is what it kind of felt like it's a bit different i mean she's i mean i think she's I'm just younger. saying like a similar, I, yeah, like a it's, similar yeah. age bracket it's not a one-to-one -one, obviously but no, no true no, i'm just saying like it's you know yeah younger you. woman ex with an experience with an older man who's in this particular age bracket that's you know yeah it's it's also I think Edie is a reference to Edie Sedgwick, that's my guess. What makes you say that? I I, I don't I think it's uh, yeah. Socialite it girl who died young in New York. Very you know what I mean. Just a fa just a little doff of the cap to, mm. you know, it girls who die young and leave a pretty corpse. Yes. Well, right, <laughs> and 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 of course Edie is is an artist or a sort of theoretically an artist in this story. Right. She's, there's there's a millennial idea. <laughs> right, 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 right. Yeah. Oh, definitely. Just the sort of constant like I'm I'm not I am I, you know I'm gonna tell people that I'm this thing, but I don't actually get make any money from it, or it doesn't or actually do like it. really or do it. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it made me think of a it made me think of a tweet. I forgot I forgot um, who sent it, but it was from like book it was like a book Twitter like writer writer Twitter tweet, but it was mm -hmm. actually really funny. And it was I think I think it just said yes I'm a writer yes I don't write we exist. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's kind and of so that's vibe Edie's here. Edie's kind of vibe with the art, but of course she starts to, and okay, spoilers, and maybe this is another kind of throwback to Wellbeck. She and there's there's so we're jumping around a little bit here, but it's fine, I think. Um, <clears throat> so she gets pregnant, and we assume from Eric, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, even though there was a rule that they that they always work. Uh, condom, but they did, found... they didn't a couple times, right? Okay, yeah, specifically they, they got sloppy. Um, and so so she gets pregnant with so with his child while living in their house because she was evicted from her apartment, and his Eric's wife Rebecca, who I think is probably the most interesting character in the book, for sure. Um, uh, or oh, point of order wasn't Eric's uh, claiming to be impotent or uh, sterile rather? Yeah. Oh, yeah. The, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you're right. I think you're right. Um, Any bit of a Mahler detail there? That yeah. no, <laughs> no. I'm sorry. It's good. Uh, no, that one. Yeah. Fine. Hey, important look, to why he's raw dogging, dude. Listen, it, some, is, it is important. 
<laughs> some baller details are important. Yeah, some are valid. Yeah, because if he is sterile, why was there a rule to not use a condom? Like, Maybe yeah. STDs and stuff. Yeah, STDs. Because assuming oh, she's yeah. having sex with other people too. That makes sense. Which she is. Which she was. Yeah. Um. Uh. What the hell was I saying? Um. Yeah, I'm sorry. Oh, oh you're talking about Rebecca. I was talking about. Yeah, no, 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 no. I was talking about um Edie getting pregnant. So she oh, gets yeah. pregnant um with eric and then kind of doesn't she doesn't want to tell anybody and she's trying to keep it to herself and sort of going through this internal debate about having an abortion which she had already had to have one when she was younger i forget exactly how old but pretty young 16 um and i think there's a lot of a lot of interesting i think whatever i'm just gonna i'm I'm, I'm just gonna make my point rather than stop and just keep saying other things (laughs) um but anyway so she gets pregnant and she starts to like produce good art again and there's like she's getting like some like sense of meaning and purpose and um it basically serves the same function in submission that the conversion to islam served (laughs) for the character in that book which is that it sort of it provides direction and provides structure to a life and 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 in that sense you know that sort of that was one of the major problems that I had with that book is that that vision of meaning and and purpose is so to me like very reductive and conservative, and it was interesting again to see a similar kind of thing play out in this book where it's the act of getting pregnant that generates yeah. the meaning. I definitely see some similarities there, but I think the major difference for me is that Edie does seem to go through. A change by the end she kind of like realizes that eric's kind of a douche um she ends up having a miscarriage right or did she take like plan b uh, i think she had like, a miscarriage a miscarriage yeah. uh, um and i also give her a little more leeway than the character in submission because no she's, doubt, yeah. young, she's young and she, you know she has had a really hard life she like her mom committed suicide and then she wasn't like talking to her dad and found out on facebook that he had died Again, some um, of the more interesting stuff. Her, the yeah, background of her family, I thought, was really interesting for sure. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot. There's more, you know, deep characterization. I would say there's some good characterization. But um, I think you're right. There, there is some sort of trope in, I don't know, in in just thinking that it's like a conservative view to just like have a baby and that'll make me happy. Like, obviously. It's just there's there is there's so much <laughs> consonant with the with the conservative stuff. I mean that that's that's overall another just sort of you know it, it's another ble- very bleak book in my mm-hmm. opinion, uh, which offers some the the kind of like glimmers of hope that it offers seem to me to j- be equally as sort of absurd and un- unsustainable, and I just don't really know what you would um, get out of it. You know what I mean? Like the, she, she sort of paints now, and like that's about it. I mean, again, it, it could be intentionally just pretty nihilistic overall, but yeah. um, I was, I was, <laughs> I was just as sort of sad as I was <laughs> reading <laughs> submission as yeah. I was reading this book. <laughs> oh, definitely. And, and it comes crazy because the other thing that was coloring my uh, opinion of this book a bit, which is maybe slightly unfair, but whatever, is like we read the Museum of Unconditional Surrender, which is sort of a autobiographical. Uh, you know, what conglomeration of various writing styles by uh, a woman author, like talking about exile and memory and all this kind of stuff. And uh, I don't know. It was just like I was kind of bringing that same level of expectation now to to this thing, even though it's a completely different book. Yeah, I mean, I uh, I had that same feeling of just like, wow, last week we read. Such a good book. I mean, it was borderline masterful for me. I love that book. And to go from that to this, which is, you know, young, well, like, this, is, this was her first novel, too. We have to. I don't yeah, that's yeah, true. Yeah. It's yeah. Raven Lilnani's first novel. Um, So it, it is hard to jump from such a masterful, masterful book last year to someone's fresh off the boat novel. But, um, yeah, I think that. Uh, Probably not the preferred nomenclature. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> Delete that part. Yeah. yeah, this this book is without papers. That De- other one is probably <laughs> delete this. Delete this. <laughs> delete this whole episode. Delete this. Um, but yeah, I mean, I mean, you know, I definitely see them as very different books. Although this one certainly, like, 
they're they're autobiographical and in, in in I think you know not obviously I don't know how much of this is autobiographical but she's clearly drawing on her some of her own experiences and and sort of um, trying to capture you know the millennial black womanhood um, in a way that is uh, you know again it's like sort of those like you said earlier Matt kind of those publishing industry catch catchphrases and buzzwords like raw and gritty and you know right. un, unflinching and and that sort of thing that people <laughs> yeah. that people love and it is those things but you know um how much how 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 much weight do those things have when that's kind of the norm or that's what we expect now from novels like this you know i have sympathy for anyone trying to t- depict in an artistically interesting way like now i don't know if yeah. i've really encountered such a thing you know it, it... vaporwave <laughs> sure <laughs> stick to this medium uh but okay. yeah you're right Got music it. music has done a much better job uh and movies as well Th- I, what i i was kind of just thinking this read like a, a like a great hbo drama series script mm. more more so than a novel almost they should have made this instead of that show uh Big What's Little that? Lies. Sh- no, 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 not Big Little Lies. The one with the one with Zendaya, uh, Euphoria. That show oh, sucks. Yeah, I what heard is that? that suck bad. It's like it's it's, a, a, it's kind of a similar kind of vibe. It's about try like, oh man, look, young kids doing drugs and having sex, and it's sad and bleak and millennials and. Yeah, if you like that show, you'll probably like this book. I didn't even like kids. The Harmony Korean. I know. Movie. I was going to say that's not, it's not even a new. I know. I know. <laughs> Um, no, I think this was actually way better than that show. I thought that show was yeah. really bad. Um, oh, speaking of uh, just what last parallel I'm going to draw between this and Huelbeck. For now. M- for now. Uh, as of this moment. Um, is the... <laughs> at the very least, there was a slight bit more imagination about how things were bad or mm-hmm. can be bad. Like the kind of polymorphous fucking ways in which you're just constantly fucked over by the modern world. Yes. She's uh, she's definitely yeah. I I think that's totally right, Matt. I think she's, she's actually more, the age where she would know what the fuck that means, and she's much more descriptive about it and able to just capture like <laughs> the feeling and the the ambience of that that bleakness that Huelbeck was only sort of as an old guy as an old white French guy just not mm-hmm. cannot be that well acquainted with. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I also don't think Lenny's particularly romanticizing this this Mm -mm. story at all i think she's she sees the lack of meaning and doesn't like it but Holbeck is more just like accepting of it like i am just a bitter old french man and i my views are set in stone and there is no changing it's just what it is but i think that lilini definitely like you know sees that something's wrong with the world and uh is judging it in some way and doesn't like it but that being said she doesn't really give any answers or really even explore the question of what else should I be doing? Where's the meaning in this? There there just wasn't a lot questioned and a lot wasn't a lot answered in this book for me. Just like it was a clear cut story about a certain set of characters in a certain time period and just kind of yeah. was sad and bleak and then it ended. Yeah. I'll I'll uh, yeah, that's I, I don't again necessarily don't even need the answers, but like the depth of inquiry about her situation or anything. It, I don't know. It was, it was, it was, it felt me a little lacking to me. I, I think for me, the, the, like maybe the part, cause I actually think there was a lot of interesting stuff in the, in here. Like, I think that the friendship she winds up forming with Rebecca, which we should talk about is really, really interesting yes. in a lot of ways. Rebecca is the wife and she's a, I mean, friendship is probably a weird word cause it's not really a friendship. I don't really know. Because it's it's like she, circumstantial relationship. Circumstantial relationship. She moves in and she sort of starts, yeah, developing this begrudging relationship with the the wife who takes her to her job as a, a like mortician, basically, right? What's the what's the term? Like she cuts apart dead bodies. Yeah. Um, for the for the VA and um, it's a morger. I think it's a morger. Morger. Yeah, <laughs> I think it's. Mor- I think it's right. That's gotta, that's, gotta, that's gotta be it. Um, and she, you know, like 
sort of but then it also it's very get racially problematic because she basically starts like paying her to do small house chores around the house uh yeah. and like just like slipping her like putting money on her bedside table and subtly suggesting that she go like clean the fucking vents or something so that's right. really gross and bad and the amount fluctuates depending on her mood yeah. which is always like interesting um, and, and there's, there's a few like, coins involved, like she'll she'll, it's which is really weird to me. It's like four hundred dollars and twenty three cents. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and and so I thought that was interesting. But there's a there's a whole other bunch of stuff. And I think like the the glimpses we get of of Edie's parents, the I have a few highlighted that I thought the writing was actually really beautiful and interesting, and that's really dark. But the the sort of driving stuff about her, like the artistic stuff, and all, all we get is like this bit where she gets better at it when she's pregnant and that i don't know it it wasn't it didn't feel like enough there yeah yeah her arc was uh not paced i guess or whatever like there wasn't enough set up uh, enough setup uh you know like there's a brief mention of her artistic career i i did like her being in publishing that does feel like one of those shitty low paying careers that like a lot of like smart liberal arts college kids end up gravitating to New York to do. Oh yeah. Uh and it and it sucks ass and it's uh I again this is the problem is Did you I, work in actually, publishing ever man? Yeah, there's you did, a, right? There's a lot of fucking things that uh that are just like it feels weird to say but like Raven Leilani is like talking at me it feels like in a number of respects like yeah. I'm, and, and, and I'm also like a little bit um, sour on it for personal reasons of just like I'm kind of sick of hearing about New York City um, mm. and, and stuff like that. Like people having floating around in, in New York City as a locale. Um, but yeah, I mean, hey, look, it's because I fucking lived there for a very long time. I briefly was in publishing, uh, did all that. <laughs> are you Matt? Are you saying yeah. that this book was hashtag relatable for you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to fucking circle it, but yes. Yeah. I also mentioned the Strand in there, and you worked at the Strand for like a little. Oh, that's now. true too, dude. I got fired from the Strand. Yep. You're you're mm -hmm. you're, you're 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 in this book, basically, dude. I'm basically, and the city's a character, and I think we need okay, to talk stop. about that. Okay, stop. God damn it! I swear. <laughs> That is that is one of the that is one of the banned phrases on this yeah, podcast. Yeah, that's a no no phrase. That is a big no no phrase on this podcast. <laughs> the city is a character. <clears throat> but I don't know how to well, feel about it, right? Because I'm so sick of hearing about fucking New York City. It's not the center of the world or even America. And it, but like, you're telling it, me. It, but at the same time, is she contributing to the even ba uh, you know bad publicity is good publicity mantra or is it, it new york is kind of uniquely qualified as an avatar for a lot of things that are wrong with the united states so i, I don't really know how to like uh judge it uh in, i don't know in a way that i feel comfortable about or not comfortable but like feel adequately <laughs> critical about, I, don't know. <laughs> I think well, there is a little bit of like maybe capitalization uh one thing i did not like about the setting was that it was rarely described it was more like mm. you know what new york city is i don't yeah. know well, most, most, most of the books most of the book doesn't even take place in new york city it takes place in new jersey no yeah, that's I mean, like weehawken or something yeah yeah that's true but i i just found that there was which is where i grew up no way yep i didn't know that as a little kid um but I don't know. Do you want to I just put your? Some do you want to just say your uh, address now, Matt? <laughs> I know. I'm way too much of my bio is getting out in this one. <laughs> I'm being infected in by the confessional mode. <laughs> lived in New York City for ten years. Lived in. I already forgot what you <laughs> said. Up, fuck New Jersey. <laughs> yeah, I won't say where. Uh, I don't know. But ba basically, I just thought that uh, it, she treated New York City like a backdrop that everyone knows, and she didn't feel the need to, like, describe it in her own unique way or something. I, I don't know. I just I noticed the lack of uh, environmental description, mm -hmm. um, like Murakami. Oh, I was actually thinking about that, um, <laughs> but I love I love Murakami, so there's a difference <laughs> there somewhere. But uh, yeah, I was thinking about Norwegian Wood a little bit. How we talked about how that kind of felt like very cold and dark and dry, but and this this book also felt that way for me. I would I would disagree. I, I would I would say it feels very like clinging clingy and sticky and warm <laughs> yeah I, I i agree like i think ma book? partially just because like it takes place mostly in the summer and we're also in Edie's head that's the one thing about the narration which is why you don't get her name for 
a large like almost at all. You get it like a, three times maybe over yep. the course of the book, which again I think is is very intentional. Like part of Edie's whole thing. She's again we have to reiterate. She's like twenty three. She's tenuously working in publishing as like a fucking copy editor or something. Uh, she lives in a shitty Bushwick apartment. Um, you know, it's 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 all her in kind of internal monologue or we're in her yeah. brain we're in her brain the whole time so we, we never really get out we're just in her head which well, is I think that, which is like I mean looking through like, a periscope or something at times you're like i want to know more but you can't because it's her brain the actual like inner monologue felt like her like her own depressive thoughts just felt cold and like a drawl for me and i think that's what i mean like it just felt like a cold writing style yeah uh, she's she's sort of cynically appraising everything for sure which is know, which is also like well back. Yes, yeah. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> was that a hiccup burp? It was a laugh meets a hiccup burp. Uh, yeah, and I <laughs> threw up in my mouth. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I agree. There is. I mean, I think part of it when you think about the the way this stuff is described, because there are a few, I thought, beautiful descriptions, or, or at least as someone who lived in New York City briefly, not as long as Matt did, and then moved, and I'm, I'm a little more susceptible to that, 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 the, that nostalgia a little bit, where people are like, oh yeah, like it smells like fucking shit, but you love it, you little fucking you shit smeller. Like, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and you're like, shut up, yeah. Yeah, shut up. Okay, yeah, I do. Stop. Yeah, stop. Dude. Um, so I'm a little. I was a little more susceptible to that. And there was some some descriptions like sort of in that vein in this book that hit, that hit for me in a way that they maybe didn't for for other people. Um, but I think when you when we think about the description of New Jersey, the town, which I don't think gets a name, is it Weehawken? Is it, I have no idea. No, I don't think Weehawken it is. is mentioned, but I don't know if it's actually supposed to be Weehawken, but. You know, it's, yeah, it's this kind of very flat, very kind of, you know, like white suburban neighborhood, which, you know, makes sense not just from her perspective as a black woman who's sort of coming as this outside figure. Like, and there's descriptions of these people who are like, there's this one woman who's just basically 24 seven watching her out her window. Yeah. Um, the which, classic yeah. old white lady at the blinds mm -hmm. sort of like um, <laughs> what are you doing out there and and i think it's you know the description's meant to be flat because the place is kind of flat like there's what is there to say about it really um which you know we can talk about whether or not that's true or in reality but i think that's supposed to be the perception of of the narrator yeah right. yeah maybe I want to read a. I'll actually. I want to read a a chunk, he where Eric takes Edie out to a club to dance, uh, and I actually thought this was a pretty nice little, uh, chunk of description. Uh, it goes, a parade of synthetic fabrics move in unison under the liquid clip of light like a school of silver herring, as some bunting near the stage that says fever pulls away from the ceiling and it occurs to me that this is one of those places in the business of reproducing a decade for a night because the bulletin by the door indicates that in a few weeks it will be the 90s but for now a workable hologram of shaka khan overtakes gloria Gaynor and her bouncy curls and shaka is cooing in her famed shredded panties squatting and saluting at the end of the stage flexing her brown thighs and smirking into the crowd though the music that is actually playing is casey and the sunshine bands that's the way which makes it feel a little spectral which is how nights like these always feel once the strobes lift for a moment and you see the beer and the glitter on the floor, the reanimation of what is dead repackaged and called nostalgia, and all that earnest time travel tempered with irony because as I look around, almost everyone is dancing, but with the sort of shrugging participation that conveys this whole thing as a joke, like, how lame, like, I dig this, but not too much. Yeah. Uh, I think that's good. good yeah. I think that's very good. I think that's really good. And I think that... Uh, uh, yeah, and in, in some ways, that's sort of like, it almost feels like a self-description of the book, because it's that packaging of like a very specific moment, all wrapped into one night, and sort mm -hmm. of like, with this shiny sort of sort of veneer, the, the, the cover of the book, maybe not insignificantly, is like very shiny and like disco-y in that yeah. way. Um, and th that's the one of the big strengths of Leilani is, I would say, her ability to kind of like, it comes in bursts like that. Like that was one sentence, and and these are the the best parts of the book for me. Where like, 
and they were and they were largely descriptive. It was it was not like exchanges or anything like that. It was mostly descriptive paragraph chunks of of con- like situations and, and place a lot of the time. There's there's um I don't know if this jumped out to you all as much as you did, Matt, but or as much as it did to me, but what you something you just said, Matt, made me think about it. This this that a lot of that stuff comes in description and and like there's very little dialogue in this book, right? Like there's not a lot of like extended scenes of of back and forth dialogue at least it seemed to me like there's obviously some and there's some conversation but like the conversations are generally pretty pretty short and there aren't a ton of them yeah it's and and that doesn't necessarily feel any more like a function of the fact that the book is in Edie's head like you would still it Mm. that's way more of like some sort of choice that maybe have been I don't know to me to my mind a little miscalculated there it's spare in, in places that feel like they should be deeper. Mm-hmm. And like that description I just for it, well and then just like to counter that, like that description I just read I really like. Uh and then there's this little sentence here that I'm just like again, it's one of these things that just feels a little more au courant in the bad. Kind of like <laughs> right guys, you know. Uh, as the city rises around me in a bouquet of dust, industrial soot, and overripe squash, insisting upon its own enormity like some big dick postmodernist postmodernist fiction, like yeah, I'm just like and and then and we're back to that sucks and like I'm just I I keep <laughs> I kept ping ponging back and forth a lot of the time. Yeah, I have a I have a nice little uh, paragraph here that goes from me liking most of it and then at the very end just absolutely hating it. So it's uh, look, good. well, okay, go ahead and then I have a I have a thought. Um, she's talking, uh, this is where Edie's talking about Rebecca. Um, I forget what page it's on cause I'm on Kindle. I'm sorry about that. Um, she begins to speak, but looks elsewhere. Um, this is talking about Rebecca writing in, writing her hands. She says she is an involved woman. That is that it is debatable whether monogamy is biologically sound and an open marriage can be good in theory, but Eric is not great at time management and could, could this thing with her husband please stop then she leaves the room apparently as excited as i am for the moment to be over for a while i lie awake in the dark wondering about how ending things with eric might feel and the answer is that it it would feel great not just because he he's borrowed any way he's borrowed anyway but because i would have the last word he may be the only man in recent memory to make me come but he is not even on twitter and that last line made me cringe <laughs> like no other i thought that was kind of funny actually <laughs> Oh, I uh, it's, it. I'm more with Paul. It's like, I get it. I don't yeah. know, but but whatever. Um, it's one of those. It's one of those sentences to me that it's a pop culture reference. I mean, okay, Twitter is like a part of our society or whatever, but still, I mean, right? Just it's get just, it out it's, of there. You didn't have to have that last line. Just so it, it just turns to like. Uh, a Vox article suddenly so so fast, and you're like, well, and up. suddenly I'm reading it with like a. Um, like a vocal fry in my head. <laughs> um, and, and that, that's the thing with some of those, some of those cringier moments is that like, I, 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 you know, I, uh, have a similar disdain for big dick postmodern novels. Um, right. it's a, it, uh, it's a cringy phrase that I don't think I would include in that context. You know, it's that's just, that's, I mean, that's all I it's mean. Like, it's the, it's, when it's like I don't, I'm not like ah, oh, fucking Twitter is such a lame thing to reference, I, or or like it's the it is the phrase and the placement. It's not the ideas even themselves all the time. It's just sort of like, nah, man, don't don't do that. Don't please. Because <laughs> I'm, I'm actually surprised you. that the uh, the movie Holes wasn't wasn't mentioned. Why is that? It's like the most millennial thing that I could think of. Is it everyone everyone loving the movie Holes? <laughs> <laughs> that's one thing i know i was I, actually it was waiting big. for it though was it even that, was it even that big i don't know I, I feel like i know a lot of people that just like loved holes just, fucking, just it was a popular book hole heads hole heads, hole heads. dude <laughs> head like a hole that's the song that trent Reznor wrote about how much he likes the books yes <laughs> really no no <laughs> okay <laughs> sorry I, okay i will say though like to that um uh, the other, the other point that I think I forget who read the quote, but like, there's a lot of. Um, I actually felt like some of the descriptions of, like, 
white people as as like these like progressive like but ultimately very neurotic and like backwards in these very like funny ways like you said matt like just unravel like eric is Eric is the worst person. Basically, he sucks mm-hmm. so bad. When his big yeah. record collection came out, it was it was he was it was curtains for Eric. Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's the he's he's really the worst. He was like, yeah. "This is a uh, you heard of Noi?" <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Boo. Ugh, no. Um. Uh, uh. But like, you know, he yeah, and he's like sexually violent. He like chokes her out yes. at one point to the point of her passing out. Punches um, her. He punches her in the face, at, like <laughs> pretty early on. Yep. Uh, like not like in a, not like in an outburst of violence, but like as a sex thing. And right. Um, which it is, is significant n- that Edie does like it though. Well, right. Yeah. She says, yeah. Um, but a- again, sort of like that's the sort of like make me feel anything millennial. Like I'll cut just her, I'll, I'll yeah. do anything. Yeah, cut her but sort of mentality. Yeah. Um. But anyway, this is just another example that, that I thought was funny about this sort of like white people, like white people trying things like, like, I don't know how else to put it, but like the rich white people. And he mentioned their open relationship. This is when they're fighting about, um, I, I think this might be when Eric first realizes that um, he has been living with them and they're like fighting downstairs and Edie is talking to the daughter whose name is Akila, I'm just going to say. Akila. Yeah, A K I L A. I think it's Akila. Um, yeah. Um, okay. When I come when I come out with my bag, Akila opens her door and motions for me to come inside. She takes my bag and tells me to take off my shoes. Your feet are horrible, she says, not looking at me, turning on the TV. I sit down on the floor and try to keep my flat, chronically dry feet out of view. It's It's going to be all night. What? Their dialogue, she says, a little annoyed like she wishes I would keep up. It's this thing they learned in therapy. Radical candor. She makes a cross she makes a cross yeah. with her fingers. It's an axis. There's also ruinous empathy, manipulative <laughs> insincerity, and obnoxious aggression. I love that. And I was just like, that's exactly what white people like like a a, a a rich, like open marriage, fucking white couple in the city. Like we're gonna approach this fucking fight with uh, our four quadrants of things we can say and right. like, it's it's so accurate yeah yes one of the worst parts about that to be like you're being ruinously empathetic yeah exactly. right now and i <laughs> am not and i'm mad and i'm obnoxiously aggressive about it one of the worst things i think after she says that she goes into saying that they go to couples therapy and sometimes they bring her I was like, what the hell would you do that for, Rebecca and Eric? That yeah. sounds like a really bad thing to do Well, your adopted daughter. This is the thing is like, again, this, this lies all ends up lying a lot more on Eric's shoulders. Uh, he ends up being the person, the most flawed and kind of dislikable character, basically. It's mm-hmm. like, he's the one who I, I lobbied for adoption. Like, Rebecca's like, I didn't want a kid. Yeah. Um Rebecca is the one who, I, I it seems like relented and allowed for this situation to occur. Like it, it, he's got her consent that he's allowed to go, you know, do this and kind of like fuck around, you know, and fu- as long as he follows like again guidelines, which just feels like another kind of potentially couples therapy, depending on how yes. woo woo the couples therapist is, uh, suggestion. So like, this is why I wanted to know more about her, because she's a. She seemed like a cool mortician who used to be into like thrash metal, uh, and or and was like an ex goth who is now yes. like a buttoned up suburban mom who is like going through it and quietly dying inside. It seems, and I just wanted more of why that was. Yeah, she's uh, that that scene. I thought that whole scene where they go to that this like like metal concert in the woods was like maybe the best one in the book like yeah or one of them i thought it was like really really well described really well written yeah i did want to ask you guys about the what i read is like sexual tension between Edie and rebecca even at like the very last five pages when she ends up like painting rebecca naked Mm -hmm. and there was one there was one end to one chapter where they like I thought they like almost kissed, but they like embraced each other and Rebecca like ran her fingers through uh, Edie's hair. I was like, what is happening here? I don't really 
understand if this is sexual or just like friendly like we're just in this together so we're like have we have this unique bond well it's uh, also like there's a i think it was you know there's also the maternal aspect to it too like where rebecca is constantly like doing mom's like making mom comments about like what she should be wearing to interviews or at the end when she goes to get move for, finally move into her new apartment like rebecca like checks the water pressure and shit so there's that that part yeah, of it yeah. too yeah yeah i don't know i there's i mean like this book is pretty sex heavy and uh as well like you know that that that's kind of Edie's preferred method of attempted connection, and therefore it's pretty. I mean, like that's like it's very pointedly like her whole thing from from go. So she gets the abortion at sixteen, and she gets fired from the publishing company for what is it like undue sexual conduct or whatever. She's yeah, like very something like that. She, she's like very promiscuous, and there's like this like <laughs> laundry list of like basically every male f- person in the office that she's at some point or another had some sort of sexual encounter with and whatnot and then th- like i guess they complained <laughs> i don't know it's, yeah, it felt yeah, very yeah. i think the whole point was it's supposed to be like sad on her end but then also like weird and like passive aggressive on the other person's end well and that it's like it's it's men who are above her in the organization who are like <laughs> now complaining about the fact that they had sex with her exactly right yeah and like feeling now uncomfortable that she's there right in the so, office yeah exactly you Isn't know she ca- also caught like sending like she she sends little emails on her company email address and they catch those or read those too so her browser history like she she doesn't go in incognito mode on her browser <laughs> yeah she just like any good person little, little little tip for everybody out there <laughs> for matt tip. i like she she fucks one guy named uh mark i think mark, at the office mark. Who's like very funny? He's like a cool cartoonist. He's like not particularly. He's not like the cool like the whatever. He he's kind of like bland, but he does something really well that she actually admires. So mm-hmm. she feels the most about it. Uh, but she just describes him as a uh, distinctly uncool, having a distinctly uncool vibration that once engaged is effusive to the point of violence. A nerd's nerd, so smitten with the niche corners of. 80s ephemera and pan-Asian iconography that his office, like his apartment, is a precarious collection of teacups, toys, and squat <laughs> fertility figurines. <laughs> and then, she, and then she just talks about she just she thinks he's the one that ratted her out and got her fired, and he's mm-hmm. not. But she just she's about to kill him or something. It seems like almost with like a samurai sword that he has in the office. Yeah. Uh, and he says she says I never said no to you, not to anything. That documentary about Norwegian puppetry was three hours long. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, that, that shit was is funny. That, that was really funny. funny dude. Yeah, <laughs> that was really fucking funny. That's like me showing a date, Brothers Quay, and being like, "No, you gotta watch Street of you Crocodiles." Watch the whole thing. No, you have to watch the whole thing, or you're disrespecting me. I and think. as a matter of fact, you can't even make sense of this unless you watch all Sfankmeyer's fucking filmography. <laughs> so really, we should have started there. It's my fault. It's okay because I have the box set. So. <laughs> First uh, day, let's watch Koyana's Katsi. Yeah. Oh my yeah. god, dude. Um Yeah, so I mean uh Again, all that stuff is super well observed and it's mm-hmm. the stuff I liked very much. Uh but also, you know, like and, and again, like not to lay judgment on promiscuity per se, but what I think Leilani herself is like it's a false mm-hmm. you know, it, it's a false sort of uh method of, of trying to connect with people by just literally physically connecting with people. Yeah, it's interesting because it's I think I do think you're right, Matt, that she has a very like ambiguous sort of view about sex in like I don't there's a ton of sex in this book, but I don't know that I would call this book like sex positive. Like it's it's I think no. I think in general she's I mean she goes back and forth because of course, right, like young girls are sexualized and like women are sexualized in ways that like make that a sort of like uh, understandable and available option as a definition of like connection and stuff. Um, And that's like outside of any one person's control, but it's also very clear that like the, the, the mere act of having sex is not working for Edith in the book right? as a way of getting connection. Well, I think it's from all sides of the characters too. Like I even think from Eric's perspective, like, the choices he's made to want this open marriage is just like 
it's a shitty thing he did and it didn't work out for him in the end and it you know we don't know what happens after um Edie is out of the relationship and out of the house or whatever but I don't know. I find open marriages and swinger whatever just like very cringe, and uh, <laughs> like it's sus. Yeah, it's to me, I, I personally, I think it's it, it's guilty till proven innocent if you're if you're uh, uh, sort of vociferously for that kind of stuff like a little too much. Yeah, I'm sorry if that's like a bummer to anybody listening, but <laughs> I don't know, man. Yeah, I mean it's. I don't know. I don't. We don't. That's probably not necessarily where we Personal want this discussion to go. Yeah, but go into, yeah. it's hard to avoid. I mean, listen. The, no, it's the, true. The, the the signature context is within an open marriage. I no, think you're right. That, in coupled with as Paul was describing, like, uh, just like dating apps and kind of serial monogamy as a as filling some sort of hole of meaning and Tinder and all that bullshit is. Even if it's not referenced directly, it's like a huge part of the sadness. No, it yeah, you right. Like, all right, all right, thanks. But but, but I think I, I think like yeah, like the the open marriage thing. It's it's just one of these like outwardly looking like the fact that they've adopted a black daughter, right, as a way to, to like look. We're the the progressive like good people look we're open we're whatever when really under undergirding it all is just like violent misogyny and like just like like horribly boiling tensions like eric's also like an alcoholic basically yep and he's like he like does shrooms when he takes his daughter to comic con and throws up and like he sucks (laughs) he He really sucks so bad he sucks very bad (laughs) Of course, yeah. I mean, like every it seems like everything that led to the current moment is basically Eric's doing. Yeah. So, I, I think one of my fa- I didn't have a lot of like favorite under underlined passages, um, but one of my favorite parts is towards the end when Eric is dressed as Captain America at Comic Con and a little girl <laughs> wants to take a picture with him, and uh, the little girl is like you know being held by Eric and she she's described as looking into his eyes and like seeing the falsehood of it and like understanding. <laughs> and I, ju- I just thought that was a great depiction of Eric is this, cause he's like, you know, described as a handsome man. He's mm-hmm. wealthy or whatever. Women desire him and whatever. But when you, when you look closer and you get like a closer look, you see the falseness of him. And I thought that was a really good cheeky little metaphor of just like, you know, this little girl seeing him clearly just by looking at his eyes. And did also been to comic con and it sucks. It sucks. <laughs> I mean, it's fun to go for like maybe a day to Artist Alley specifically, but fuck, man, it's it's a lot of not fun. Which that's what she mentions in this book, right? Right. The, the Artist Alley where she finds yeah. It. Well, in in, in that's well, in inspired, another way that Eric is. Yeah, 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 yeah. Hmm? yeah. I was just gonna say that's another way that Eric is like John Mulaney because John Mulaney recently went to rehab. So, oh, that's right. And so did that. uh, or Rob Delaney. Rob Delaney. Is that another John, guy? Wait, John Mulaney. What did I say? Did Rob I say, yeah. Delaney. He's a Twitter comedian, stand-up guy. That's right? who I. That's who Eric is supposed to be. Oh, okay. okay. I'm Not so John sorry Mulaney. if people were fr- like screaming for an hour now about that that wasn't addressed. But <laughs> I don't know if I know who that. Who is that? That makes more sense to me, actually. Yeah. Oh, John Mulaney guy. did go to rehab for alcoholism. Yes, he did. So he kind of makes it's kind of he's kind of a combo. <laughs> Oh, I could, yeah, I could see it. This, this kind of even makes more sense. The Rob Delaney, you know, like the, you know, like imagine if Hassan was like uh, forty-eight or something, just like woke bay mm-hmm. kind of type of guy, but yeah, like, yeah, but problematic. Right. Exactly. I see the character as Mark looking a little bit more like John Del- John Delaney, and Eric looking like Rob. What? No, you got to twi- no. you got to twist it. <laughs> John De- John Delaney was a Democratic presidential candidate. <laughs> John Mulaney is the yeah. Yes. Okay, so Mark is John Mulaney and Eric is. Be- I forgot his name already. It's fine because you know it's what? Fine. He's an exquisite yeah. corpse of all three. Exactly. Yeah. Just right. Like oh. Amalgam man. <laughs> Am- Amalgam man. Yeah. <laughs> it's a tongue twister. Amalgam man. That's kind of fun. Oh uh, yeah. Um. Uh, I want. I. I think. Uh, obviously, it's worth talking about the like, sort of. There, there's moments again talking about the sort of like liberal the like casual liberal racism of Rebecca mm-hmm. and and um uh fucking who boy the guy Eric, Eric. <laughs> um 
uh, like a, sort of they uh, there's various occasions where they kind of like assume that she is going to like develop a re- like a sort of you know black mama like mentorship relationship with their adopted daughter right, and yeah. like they leave like they haven't even attempted to like figure out anything to do with her hair which is a black girl's hair and requires like specific stuff not, i don't know anything about this obviously but like just those sorts of things the, the sort of like casual assumptions and and oversights and things like that they're also deeply paranoid about assuming and then not and then not assuming too much and be you know they just hilariously get it wrong like what to not care about and what to care about yes which is always very f- funny and sad basically at the same time and a lot of what happens to like very well-meaning, you know, liberal progressive people, especially when engaging with like other races and cultures. Yeah, yeah. You know? I mean, there, I, there was a great scene at the end where I think towards the end where they're where like they're a little nervous about um, Akila's uh, Comic Con costume being too like racy or whatever, and they're like debating about it outside, and they say something like, uh, you know, Rebecca says something like we can't just let her do whatever she wants because she's black. That's just bad parenting. And it's just like <laughs> this perfect, like, you know, it's like, or she says like, that's not being progressive. That's just bad parenting. Yeah. And it's just like so funny to me. Right. He's like skimpy dress is not just, it's not intersectional feminism. Yeah. Right, like right, right. 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 <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's pretty rough. And then they just assume a sort of kinship that Akilah and, and, and fucking Edie are going to have. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's pretty funny. There's also another interesting like um, relationship with one of the other black characters, which I forget her name, but she's a uh, East Indian woman who is like essentially the person who takes over Edie's job when she gets canned. Oh yeah. Early on. Yeah. 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 Just as like a minor sort of like difference in perspective about how to approach their respective places in society where she's, she's a little bit more like, I'm literally going to shuck and jive until I'm the girl boss. Right. And Edie's way more of like the, I'm going to be so. That's a quote, by the way. That's not Matt. That's not me. That's yeah. not Matt's words. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, uh, and then Edie's like way more of the, I'm going to be so authentic that I'm, I'm scary to everybody. Right. Which, you know, is a lot of the time it, it's, it's fueled by uh, probably her being a black woman, but, it also is just is genuinely a lot in a lot of the ways like I think Edie is interesting because she's she is just a, like a little bit too emotionally unstable it seems like in a lot of ways for reasons that are like outside of her control by and large but like she reminded me ag- again in of like uh, Lucy from the Museum of Unconditional Surrender mm-hmm. the person who's so mm-hmm. fucking emotionally distraught and available at the same time that it's like <laughs> off putting as shit. I don't know. I, I think she's interesting in that she's more complicated than that. You know, she's not just like she's making her fucked up choices, you know, too. Yeah. And a lot of times yeah. knowing in the moment that like, fuck, this is good. This is not the move, but I'm doing yeah. it. Yeah. This isn't it. And then, of course, but, but but of course, right. Like she's also swept along by, like you said, many forces that are outside of her control. Like not Eviction. even just, yeah, not even like just racism and, and misogyny and all that, but like eviction, like losing her job, like all that. Kind Living of shit. in shitty New York, yep, also yep. just on top of it. Yep, pretty much. Well, and really, just you're, you're... The, the emotional mm. trauma of losing their, her parents at a young age too, and just being like, you know, that's a that's a huge part of it too. It makes her a very sympathetic char- character overall. Yeah, it definitely establishes like, uh, you know, I I think partially why she is so seeking of any sort of connection, you know. She's yeah, definitely she's someone who's like, like uh, oh, I lived in like bumfuck upstate New York with really troubled parents, and like, you know, I what I went to art school, and like, I'm gonna be, out. I'm gonna be the cool art school New Yorker girl who's like completely other from my family, and and that's yeah. always kind of a false idea as well, you know. Totally, and um, yeah, I mean, I, putting myself in her shoes or whatever is just like you know, when I was 23, it just seems like a long time ago now, and just being so emotionally immature, even now, personally. Mm-hmm. But um, <laughs> you know, it, it's a yeah. crucial time in your life, and um, she's like, you know, she's making mistakes and living her life and doing what she thinks is like best for her at the time, and she has, you know. 
just from being a little bit older and it going through those 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 ages um i did get the feeling that she's gonna find maybe something good eventually some like she, i think there's a little little sliver of optimism towards the end um yeah yeah i i, I like you get the sense that Edie will land on her feet um and yeah. she is super young like 23 is nice uh, and uh you know it's pretty n- a nice young age to have sort of a, a a personal epiphany of some sort where she's maybe going to i don't know approach life in ways that are more productive to her i, I don't know you get the sense that that's what's happening like that that she's actually like on the up and up yeah slight, yeah slightly and I, yeah and i definitely think that this experience she had with eric is just like i shouldn't date people that are in their 40s just because i'm attracted to them sexually um, well it's not even that he's in his 40s is that he sucks yeah, so he's a piece yeah. of shit. <laughs> yeah, I just think she she ends up just like maybe questioning That's what's wrong. her attractions maybe a little bit. I don't know. Yeah, seeking meaning through men essentially, I think is the big one. Like, yeah, and yeah, like Eric, whatever she sort of describes him at the beginning as. I mean, I feel like Eric was actually, like, for everything that we know about him, I feel like he was not particularly, like, well-developed as a character. Like, he, we know that he sucks in a lot of ways because he does he, shitty, terrible things. But I think that's kind of part of the point because when it all comes out in the, at the end, he's just an average, like, shitty white guy. Like, and there is nothing special about him, which is sort of what, what she comes to it, by the end of the story. Yeah, and this, yeah, yeah. that's why I think the metaphor of like the Captain America suit is a good one for him. Yes. Like, there's a there's an initial allure about Eric because he's, you know, handsome and well off and he's a daddy. Um but once you get to know him a little bit more, you just realize he's just a piece of shit. And he's making really bad choices in his forties and he has a family and he's just fucking weird. Um I think one of the weirdest parts of the book, I don't know if you picked up on it or thought it was weird too, is just that he was he was the one that wanted to adapt adopt a daughter. She ends up being yeah. a little a black girl. And then I think it's like pretty soon after that he starts dating Edie, who's a young black girl. And I just found it fucking like slightly gross and questionable. You're supposed and weird. to and mm-hmm. and I think that Rebecca when she like you know, there, there's a weird scene where Edie um, breaks into the house um, and uh, Rebecca's there and catches her and they kind of like run out down the street and shit. <laughs> um, but Rebecca ends up at one point saying that she's like surprised by how she looks and she's kind of like off put by it. Not because she's black, but because her adopted daughter is black. And that's how I read that scene. It was just like, what the hell's up with Eric? This is the girl. Yeah, Rebecca's learning about. a little bit about Eric. <laughs> yeah. yeah, about his. Rebecca's like, ah, okay. He's clearly yeah. has some some un unaddressed racial and women issues just in general. Yeah, but yeah. that being said, I, I do agree, Gay, that he's a little underdeveloped. Even I think, but, yeah. But again, which I think might be intentional because he's supposed to be just this avatar of like white mediocrity, where he's just like this. He's he's attractive to a certain like type of person for just just because he's handsome and like makes a decent salary, but he's just could, he just could be literally anybody. Yeah, it kind of reminds me of uh, the main character in Gone Girl, Ben Affleck's character, very similar <laughs> to that. Just like <laughs> handsome suburban man, um, but there's not much to him deep down. She also makes a lot of like just the like there's a decent chunk where she's just like. I realized it was just kind of his, there's like his physical appearance. And then secondarily, she was like, and then just some weird idea of just by sheer dint of his age, like accumulated years. I actually found this a little bit grotesque for some reason, Mm. because like it's coupled with the fact that she's like, you think it's cool. (laughs) You just because you made it 46 years uh, and, and avoided the, uh, the compulsion to kill yourself each day that you're hot. <laughs> I, was just like, I was just like, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. 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 Uh, that's, I mean, another, yeah. Another sort of one of these like cynical moments of, of like, you know, this black pilling. No. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, 
I, I think the other one of the other things that I liked about the book is that she does a, also a really good job of capturing like what I mean. Okay, what I imagine or does a good job of explaining what it might feel like as a sort of person of color to try to have to exp- like deal with racism and explain it on these on these like very small levels, right? So there's like a a scene where um, uh, the family has hired a like a a, a tutor for Akila in math. And she's like struggling Pradeep. with Pradeep. Yeah. And so uh, he, she's like struggling with a problem and Edith hears him like from the other room say like, w- like, what's the matter with you? A monkey could do this. And like, and she's like, Oop, that no, no. Yeah. And she goes to try to try to sort of point like, Hey dude, you can't say that. And like the daughter, Akilah's like, just don't like, just don't, I don't want the fucking, drama and then she has to she tells Rebecca about it eventually and he's 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 fired but like and there's a lot of moments like that or like there's a moment where Eric is they're doing Akilah's hair and Eric comes down the stairs and he's like what stinks and then he like realizes that it's her like hair products and he's like oh god I'm so never mind (laughs) yeah he's like black girl stuff yeah yeah that's like (laughs) like leaves I and is contrite yeah that's what she writes yes and I like the thing with with Pradeep was also weird because Rebecca is painted as as flirtatious with Pradeep. Mm-hmm. So there's just like I don't know, it, that was kind of funny. It just like she's like maybe wants to fuck Pradeep and is ignoring this, and then is pissed when you know Edie points out that he's a little bit abusive to her daughter mm-hmm. in a lot of ways and makes her kind of self esteem, you know, and make her hate math. Uh, and then finally, and she hates having to reckon with that because she likes him. It seems like a little, I don't know, just like very strange, fun drama, you know? It's drama. It's a drama-heavy little book. Oh, there's drama. Yeah. Yeah. It's spicy. If you like spicy drama, it's good. Um, well, so this is actually the, this is actually, uh, th- this. I think this is worth reading because this is about that pretty deep thing when she tells Rebecca about it. And I think this is just a good description of, of, like what this experience might feel like. It's this is on one nineteen to one, to on going on to one twenty. Um. Uh. Da, da, da. It just seemed this is uh, Edith speaking. It just seemed like he was being kind of hard on her. She needs a firm hand, she says, though she has stopped eating, stopped smiling. It wasn't like that. The way he was talking to her, it felt specific. I say, and there is no fluffy alternative word for what I'm trying to convey. No way to effectively explain violations that are not overt. It's a rhetorical hellscape. A casual reduction to so frequent it is mundane. Almost too mundane for the deployment of the R word. As with a certain sect of good white person, the accusation overshadows the act. Racism, I should yell, because... Uh, because I'm sure Rebecca will receive it in the uppercase regardless, and I, already I feel her seizing on the drama of its implication. Even though racism is often so mundane it leaves your head spinning, the hand of the ordinary and your slow psychic death so sly and absurd that you begin to trust, distrust your own eyes. So it has taken a long time for me to get here to say, yes, this is what happened. It happened just like that. But when Rebecca turns and scrapes the rest of her food off the plate and into the trash, I feel like a jerk. <laughs> she looks at me and any goodwill that existed between us was lost. And I just think there's a lot going on there about like, you know, how to how the the pressures of handling a situation like that from that perspective and yeah. Yeah, I mean those those dynamics I think were the, my favorite parts of the book. Just trying to get into Rebecca's head a little bit was difficult. You don't really know, or you never get like a clear explanation about how she feels about everything. There's little hints here and there, and she ends up eventually saying like, "You got to get out of here." I'm I'm, you have to leave in like a month, which I was still just like a month seems like a long time if you want her out. But um, yeah, but yeah, there, those those dynamics were interesting. I like the the weird mother dynamic that she had, but there's also you know this obvious like disdain and not hatred, but like you know I she didn't she was uncomfortable about the situation, which I think is obviously realistic. It's it's and it's a weird uh, situation and turn of events that get her in the house living there too um it's not like eric asked her to she ends up just showing up one day and then kind of staying and um, she lives there for a long time without eric even knowing she's there he's he's out of town or something it's like hide her in the house (laughs) (laughs) yes 
Um, yeah, she's just kind of living there through inertia eventually. Like, she gets booted out of her... She gets evicted after having lost her job. And then she... Or no, she gets she loses her job, and then there's a pretty funny just sort of passage of where she's like doing like Uber Eats or, or Fresh Direct or something. Yeah, there was some funny bits in there. Right, Task Rabbit or whatever she was doing, and uh, and then that obviously just is is a nightmare, and she's exhausted and barely makes enough money to survive on that, and then she gets hey, I, I did the. Uh- I had I had issues with that with those passages because I was a postmate driver in the Midwest, okay, in a big city for like three years, and I really liked that job. I was like, this is pretty fucking fun. I drive around the city, get the parallel park all the time. I don't know it, that that felt well, a little bit like I love parallel parking too. What? I think that was a very <laughs> m- millennial no, passage to me of just like maybe the ungrateful attitude of millennials, just like oh, I have to freaking like deliver food for people in this city and i'm just like well don't maybe just don't live in new york city first off um i don't know i just i had issues with it just like it was a little too drab and a little too cold and icy it's like you know people have to do that job sometimes who cares yeah but it but also like well okay i maybe this is maybe this is going to get into a discussion about economics but i think i my attitude is not that because people have to do a job, we're we're not allowed to say that the job sucks and is dehumanizing. Like no, I mean I agree with you, but it's just like it, it felt a little. I don't know. It just felt a little too like my world is ending. My life sucks. During those passages for me, it was a little too much. I just was like, but like yeah. I I have a hard time after uh, you know. It's just sort of the like a person just being miserable. Unrelentingly, just it gets tiring fast for me. Uh, at this yeah, point, yeah. you know, th- there was like, again, there was a point definitely when I was like in my early twenties where like I would have probably eaten this up a lot more readily, but like, I, I, it's just more like, yeah, the, the, she, she's absurdly unfortunate and, uh, and you know, that that's to evoke certain things and whatever. I think it serves the 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 story itself but per, my cup of tea is not to wallow in that for too long narratively even mm-hmm. or i just i just i yeah I, I just get tired of it a little bit so that's yeah. the only reason i was like it's like when i was watching the revenant which paul you like i don't like it uh or as tim heidecker says the relevant the relevant <laughs> i'll tell you what isn't relevant that movie anymore uh <laughs> got you um but when he I'm like sure. i'm not sure if it ever was I when still he, like it. When, when I remember I was in the theaters watching that movie. This is loosely, this is whatever, but like, you know, a lot of bad shit happens to Leo's character. We can agree, right? Uh, yes. When he finally, his broken arm heals or whatever from his bear fight and uh, he can walk and he and he steals, he eats a, a buffalo liver and then gets chased by Indians <laughs> and his horse falls off a cliff. <laughs> And he gets naked. And, and, he, and, he, and, he, and he gets naked because he's going to freeze to death and he has to cut open his horse and go inside. <laughs> I was just like, I was losing my mind at that point. I was laughing so hard because I had already seen like at least two hours of other terrible shit happen to Leo. And he's just co- covered in, in guts and blood. And he's screaming and he's throwing up from eating a liver. <laughs> I and, thought they smelled bad. On the outside. The outside. Uh, and then... Uh, yeah, it, it was just like I had a couple of those moments during this book too. Yeah. Where I was just like, Jesus fucking Christ! All right. Yeah, yeah. No, I think that I actually think that's a that's a that's a decent like uh, analogy. Like it's just it's just yeah. Like there's again right. There's like gritty whatever. This is the world as it is, and it's and it sucks. And like you know, like there's the there's the uh uh like level to this that we just can't know how much more it sucks to be black and a woman than it right. sucks to be people like us um, or the various fun and fun being that's not, that was a joke. <laughs> was, yeah. Like, the, like all of the, all of the various additional ways that it can suck, that it just can't suck for us. Exactly. Um, yeah. And so there's that to it too, right? Like, fu- like, you know, fuck. If that's if this is what it is, then yeah, okay, right. Like then, but but yeah, it does. It there are, were moments where it had that almost 
almost comedic, like just nonstop shitstorm. Like right. one thing after another. Just but. Mr. Magooing it through the entire yeah, exactly. world. Exactly. <laughs> and who knows? Maybe that was intentional. Maybe parts of that were supposed to be comedic in that in in that sort of particular way. I think a lot of it was supposed to be very was supposed to be funny. Mm-hmm. Like it, again, it, it reads a bit also like, and this is a criticism. It reads a bit like a first first novel. Like it's very try hard in its descriptive things, and that's where things like Hel- Helga Pataki vibes, <laughs> yeah, start to come in. Um, it's definitely try hard. So it's just a little try hard, which you know that's not the worst thing I could say. I liked the um, her getting a. Uh, Eric soliciting a uh, a pussy pic from her as she's being evicted. Oh my god, that was really yeah. That's pretty funny. I had a I, I had a, a a friend of mine's sister <laughs> got a dick pic at a funeral, and I was thinking about that. Oh my god, <laughs> <laughs> terrible. Like, you know, again, the kind of stuff that uh, you have, you know. That is the, the <laughs> that is more of the dystopian reality, right? It's like you can get a I picture of a man's th- turgid penis at your mom's <laughs> funeral. I really it's hope terrible. that it was random. It's I really hope that so it was bad. random, and she and he wasn't like, "Where are you?" And then she was like, "At a funeral." And then he sent it. <laughs> then he was, was like, like "Oh, LOL. baby, oh, rigor mortis. Yeah. This will be nasty." That's yeah. terrible. I really hope that didn't happen. I'm a freak. <laughs> you like this, don't you? Yeah, that's. That, that I, was I, a very funny moment. Dark, very dark, but fu- quite funny. I, I highlighted this little chunk. Uh, she's watching Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, which is a show I think she it's, she likes, Edie. And um, there's a mini little statement on art, too, which I found interesting. So it says, uh, I'm, I have a PDF, so I don't know exactly where this is for you guys. It's 70 for me. But um, in the neighborhood of make-believe, King Friday is judging an art contest, but Lady Elaine Fairchild will not submit to his judgment. She says art is subjective, and technically that is the moral of the story, though it is also implied that everyone in the kingdom thinks her art is bad, which, if she is making art that is meant to be seen by others, is a serious tough titty, the comfort of audience subjectivity pretty much null when the audience is everyone and everyone has decided subjectively that the art is bad. (laughs) You know. I don't know what she's doing there, but it feels very pointed to me. Yes. Yeah. About her. About... Leilani, right? kind of. Yeah. Via Edie. And I don't know what you make of that. Well, like that's the whole, that's the, that's the thing, right? There's definitely like a uh, there's a there's an under. It's not it's not really a subplot per se. It is a little bit, but there's an undercurrent of like art and like the creation. What is it? She, art. What is it, dude? Exactly. And there's and the creative process and all that and there's this painting that she has of her of her dead mother that she kind of carries around with her and doesn't like looking at and um yeah so I think it's there's that part like, of it was interesting I don't know if Paul as our resident artist has any thoughts or what were you saying that uh, oh you can I, go Paul they were okay maybe this is a particular thing just about me but I just hate. Since I went to art school, I hate when anyone just says like I'm buying gesso, or like ultra <laughs> marine blue and shit. I, I don't know. <laughs> art that school is very general. specific. That's a little niche. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> art niche. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe I was just around it too often. About you know, and around these people that were a little too arty. So I just it, I don't like I don't even like hearing or reading the word at this point. <laughs> um, <laughs> so maybe I'm not the one. That, well, wait a um, minute, hold on. I'm, I got to interrogate that for a minute, dude. We're reading Killing Commendatory in like four weeks, and you love that book. So all literally all about art and painting. Gesso. Yeah, but and gesso. Yeah, That's a gesso filled like, book. Uh, it's written a lot better. I think maybe that's all I can say is that. Uh, Lindsay oil. Know. What it, do you feel about that? It's okay. Gouache. What do you think about something like that? I like gouache. This is an All art right. podcast no. now. Turpentine. I like uh, well, lapis lazuli. What do you? How do you feel when I say that to you? I don't know what that is. Art. It's just this is just art term ASMR hour. <laughs> is that someone's name? <laughs> no, it's a color. It's blue. Okay. It's mentioned in the in this book. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I think what's the, the final thing that's interesting to me is uh is just the implication of of like art's role in this book because it, i find i think it's significant that like this is raven leilani's breakthrough it's her first book 
she is she is now in a position very probably very different from the one she was prior to this publication where she's got a lot of people fucking love this book and True. she's she's got a lot of eyes on her and stuff and she's financially probably a little better off and all this uh and i just find it interesting like art's role in Edie's life it feels way more precarious but the implication is that she's kind of like she's found her confidence to assert that she's an artist and and therefore can begin the work and uh, like Gabe was saying you know that arc didn't land as that strongly and if that's the intention that it's supposed to feel like she's um achieved some breakthrough or higher form you know yeah and yeah, I mean, so, yeah, go ahead, Paul. Uh, just to answer a little bit more seriously, not to say I hate Jesso. Um, <laughs> I think you're right. Like, it's hinted at that this may be her way out to find meaning, if that's what this story is about, anyway. I mean, it, it seems like, you know, she was inspired by that one artist at Comic Con. Um, I think it is kind of implied that she wants to, like, work for her or something. I can't really remember. But, you know, it does seem like you're right, though. It doesn't totally land that this is going to be her way out. There's no like uh, at the in the end, it doesn't really say that she's, you know, really, truly trying to pursue this in any form. Um, but it does seem like you could put the pieces together and that could be something that she's trying to say is that like, you know, this is actually what she, Edie does find meaningful in her life, um, potentially. And maybe that's going to be what makes her happy down the line. I don't know. Definitely, but it's like, I think it's definitely clear to me that dating older daddies is not going to be the answer to her problems. That's true. That's a given at this point. Mm -hmm. I'm saying like, what, what glimmer, what light at the end of the tunnel, if any, is being offered here? Because to me, it seems like, like expression of self-expression. Well, my problem is that like I feel like it's it was a more of a facile bit of a of this notion that is also very millennial, ironically. Which is that, like, if you're able to authentically express yourself via art, like, you will be saved. Yeah. Or even more so. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. I think you're, and you're right, bringing it back to the millennial, the millennial thing too, because like, there's right, there's these few moments where, yeah, she's inspired by the the woman at Comic Con, and then she has this, like, a, maybe you guys were talking about this when I when I stepped away for a second to the, uh, had to go to the bathroom because I'm a human. Um, but, uh, when she's going under to get her abortion and the nurse is kind of gently asking her, like, did you talk about this already? No. The, nur the nurse, the nurse is asking her like, oh, what do you do? Everything, like, just as like a, everything's going to be okay. Kind of like nurse com making conversation or whatever. Right. And she initially says, oh, I don't do anything. But then she kind of like, as she's drifting off to get the abortion, she's like, no, 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 wait, wait, wait. I'm an artist. I'm an artist. And like, that's right. supposed to be this big, like revelatory moment of her kind of asserting, this is what I am. This is what I want to do. And, but again, it, it first, like that moment didn't again, like totally land for me in, as like, as like, as re revelatory as I think it was supposed to be, but subjectively important to Edie. It did read totally, correct. totally. Mm -hmm. Um, but also that that is another very millennial thing, which is just like manifesting. You know what I mean? Like just right, if you yeah. just state it and, and and say it out loud enough times, you're gonna manifest it. Um, and I think that you know certainly the end of the book is preliminary. It's tenuous, right? She's just kind of said, okay, I'm an artist for real. Who knows what happens after that, right? Um, right. And I think that's probably intentional, but you know that might not work for everybody as a as a way to end it. Yeah, I just and I found the inspiration the the artist at Comic Con to be uh, again something that I just I have a personal bone to pick with, which is like autobiographical comics and like specific like I'm just like it's the it's the provenant of the most mediocre comic book artists in my opinion. It's just like write what you know. It's well, you know, my mom was a little mean to me. Blah blah blah. Uh, I mean, it's another black woman, obviously, so that's significant. Mm -hmm. But, like, she's, you know, the title of her, she's like, oh, I, my comic book's about uh, my struggles with finding adequate psychotherapy. And I'm mm -hmm. like, fuck off. Like, <laughs> I, can, I couldn't think of a shittier, more millennial, dumb thing to, and she's like, these are beautiful. <laughs> like, these, <laughs> these drawings are so fucking beautiful. I'm crying. Dude, did you see them? Did you see the drawings? You don't fucking I'm literally know. crying and shaking You don't fucking right know. You don't know if you saw, you don't know what they what they looked like. Honestly, this I don't know that's enough what, about that's comics what to she like. Said. Yeah, it's just ever since fucking uh, 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 God damn it, what's that Bechtel Bechtel book? Um, I literally don't know anything about comics. 
fun home. It's just been like oh yeah, that was a, that was they turned that into a play, right? Yep. Yeah, and that was it. And then and that, it's all been downhill from there. Just people chronicling their like struggles with the, it's it's like comic book versions of this book, honestly. Yeah, yeah. A bit. No, no. Actually, because this I is have fictionalized, a couple. But I have a couple comic books like that that I really like. I'm not saying like, it's a bad. I'm not come saying back, it's bad. Come back next time for a debate about autobiographical comic genre. I'm not. No, saying I actually. It's bad, I'm man. not. I'm not saying that. It, it, yeah, I, I know what you're saying, man. I'm just saying I actually think they work. Stories like this work really well in comic form, actually. Um, okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I have one in particular that I don't remember the name of, uh, but it's really good. I, uh, maybe I'll review it on a on a video one day. Yeah, you should. You should. Do we it. should. We should debate each other. That should be. <laughs> oh, that's good Patreon wonder. content. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like yelling at each other, hurting our feelings. Oh, yeah, which we forgot. Which we forgot to plug at the beginning of this show. That's okay. That's okay. It's all right. We have one. Guys, we have a Patreon. Um, but yeah, let me just see if there's any other random. There was one other chunk of just one more example of these descriptive bursts that I really enjoyed. Mm. Um. About because Akila's kind of a black anime nerd, which is kind of a genre person, uh, yep. which is pretty funny. And she's just and and Edie's not, and so she's just sort of describing this kind of like zoomer, yes, uh, anime girl's room and uh, the posters of K pop boy bands and shit. And it's very funny. And she goes, uh, Because of my sexless career as a high school studio art kid. I was frequently adjacent to the prototypes for girls like this. Girls who were horse girls, except with cats. Girls with patches and pins who uploaded their suicide girl auditions with the translucent computer lab Max. Girls who were goth light, in and out of Hot Topic and torrid with their weepy, sallow boys. Shy dabblers in anime and D&D. <laughs> Though in the years I have been away, I see it has gotten sexier and more bleak. The interludes between Aquila's shrines to Guillermo del Toro and Tim Burton dripping in intermediate sorcery and sex. Bloody grindhouse stills framed next to fishnets and wilted go-go boots. All the hairless CGI men with their hips canted. Corollaries of the comic stacks and spell scrolls and everything else exalting the perfect and unreal. It's good. It's good, really good. That's great. It's That's fantastic. why I don't like Comic-Con, too, just for, incidentally. Yeah. One thing I liked that. about when she was describing comic con was um she must have gone because she she knew this little detail about there's people that have like five day passes and they have yeah. like a, what a two day pass and she that got convinced there on like me the too third day yeah yeah i just i was like she must have been to one because there's these people that kind of just like look like zombies like they haven't been sleeping the whole time and they're dressed and they're like mortal <laughs> mortal combat or something like that and they're just like staring at her like they know she's just got here and she's not a real fan or right comic conner that funny that, that funny, funny meme of like a like a <laughs> paunchy kind of spider-man it's like no one's trying to see depressed spider-man <laughs> 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 no no dude it's like what if superheroes were real have you ever heard of watchmen <laughs> oh, so? they have emotional problems like me oh. Oh. Uh. snyder cut snyder cut <laughs> <laughs> i think that oh god <laughs> this is a Snyder Cut podcast now. Um, uh, yeah, we're going into the next four-hour segment. Dear, yeah, I know, dear God. <laughs> um, anything else that we wanted to read or touch on before we do... Uh, do some wrap-up? Do some wrap-up, do some, some games, some fun and games. I'm ready for the wrap-up. Yeah? Yeah. Matt, anything? No. No, 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 no. Is that another reader? Oh my god, you're a reader. I did that before. I've done that a bunch. No, we should. Uh, Yeah, keep that up. uh, That is the other part of that song. Once you get to the other half of the Williams score. Oh, I've never gotten to the back half. There's a sort of pizzicato, like plucky thing with Glockenspiel. Oh, like yeah, yeah. That's what I was doing. There you go, Paul. Okay, I got it. What is uh, well, I'm going last. If, so, or no, well, we're doing, no, uh, dude, we're we got to sort Potter, these yeah. characters, dude. We got to sort yeah. these. This is the. Well, still, this I'll is, go last. We literally just read another book, so we get to talk about Harry Potter and put yeah. all of the characters into a house. That's right. Uh, where do we wish we start? Edie. 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 I 
I thought Matt would like that one. Wait, what did you say? I said Edie and Edie. Edie oh the millennial God. Cartoon oh, Networks. Nice. Okay. <laughs> Holy shit. Okay, that I'm took me a that. second. That took me a second. Um, poof. Hufflepuff? Talk about a show about suburban malaise. Ed, Ed, and Eddie. Yeah, anyway. you're not kidding. Hufflepuff. Hufflepuff, maybe? Like, no, nah, I don't know, dude. This She's tough, actually. Yeah. Yo, she's a hot mess. <laughs> <laughs> me. Oh my god, me this. Uh Hmm. I Why don't know, you she's Hufflepuff she's, game. Well, she's, just cuz I don't know. I feel like Hufflepuffs are just kind of like <coughs> you know, like I feel like she's just like dark Hufflepuff, like as in like angry and sad. Like uh Puff. Like, you know, like, like I don't know. She's described as kind of just, like, floating through and, like, doesn't have a, a... I don't know. I don't know why I think those are Hufflepuff traits. But she does... She definitely has a bizarre um, attachment to Eric in terms of if we're thinking about, like, loyalty and shit like that. We talk about Hufflepuffs. Yeah. For a while, anyway, yeah. she does. And, she, uh, yeah, it's definitely, like, fear that drives her a lot. So, I, I don't know. I wouldn't... Like, maybe she gets a little self-confidence or something at, towards the end more mm-hmm. so, but I wouldn't call it bravery. So I'm just like, she's not really like confronting uh, anything effectively, I would say, really. Yeah, but she might be. She might be moving to become a Gryffindor. True, but at, for the time being and for yeah. right now, I'm going to go ahead and also agree that it's Hufflepuff. Yeah, I think well, I was debating Slytherin a little bit just because... I was too, yeah. Um, yeah. That's Eric. Yeah, as me, as a goody-two-shoes boy... I would never like break into someone's house and just like look at their. I w- that would freak me out. But I'm not saying that's. And you're Hufflepuff. Only a s- I am a Hufflepuff. Yeah. <laughs> um, but <laughs> she never is. Stop being if mad you're saying it. she's a Hufflepuff, can Hufflepuffs uh, break in and snoop? I guess they can. Yeah. Whatever. Of course. Uh, yeah. Yeah. If they can rape, they can snoop. <laughs> God <Yes>. damn it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you yeah, know. I think maybe I agree. I, I would say Hufflepuff overall. The only small detail I was going to think about was you know the. Breaking an entry and also the uh, shoplifting towards the end, but that's uh, Akila. Yeah. She's she's the one who leads yeah. the shoplifting, and the B and E is is because of attachment. Yes, she's, she's it's just because gotta, she forgot. Like, yeah, mm. or or wait, no, that's later. It's because she wants to. Yeah, it's because of the attachment. Just rifle through Eric's stuff and like yeah. smell him. <laughs> yes, uh, Eric is uh, very Helga Pataki. Eric is fucking Slytherin, dude. He's, he's Slytherin. Totally Slytherin. He's the guy who's just. Got, gotten through life through with an aw shucks charm and being tall and kind of handsome but clearly he is an incredibly conniving human being yes. like he's he's engineered the all these entire situations and it just spun out this one time for him basically it yep. feels like yeah so. i feel like there could be a book like a sequel about eric where he just finally gives in to his indulgences and actually becomes a serial killer <laughs> <laughs> i mean yeah he definitely it feels like an eric sequel or a prequel a little bit he's definitely he's, got he's a freaking psycho. serial killer mentality yeah yeah potential huge potential there so we all agree slytherin for for eric yeah mm-hmm. yeah what about okay rebecca? rebecca gryffindor i i i was between gryffindor and um ravenclaw of course but i, I me too but uh it's, she was goth really so it's hard not to think of a raven <laughs> uh, <laughs> Edgar Allan Poe, uh, but uh, <laughs> Raven, uh, Raven Leilani, <laughs> Raven Leilani. Oh that's my god! So Raven. Oh Millennial. my god! That's so Raven, dude. <laughs> Millennial media. <laughs> Did we? We already made the that's so Ravenclaw joke, I think. But um, mm. no, I'm gonna go with Gryffindor, man. I like. I feel like. She's repressing more than the average, Definitely. you know, would trying be. Trying to keep it together. But I think she's she's trying to, like, she's she's like the negative end of Gryffindor a bit. She's got things way too on lock, you know? Like, she's in, in the name of, she's, like, being brave because she's, like, confronting things that frighten and and are painful to her for the sake of, like, whatever, others, potentially. Mm. And she's just fucking cutting open like VA cadavers and just like going to death metal. Con- I don't know. I just thought it was Gryffindor. Personally. I hear you. I, 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 it's, it's a good, fair. It's a fair position. She's a hard one for me because I would say she's very Ravenclaw in her 
you know, more nerdedom gothness for sure. Yeah. But I, uh, she's Gryffindor for me too, just for being like a nice, good person, I would say, in a really weird, tough situation. And she's, you know, I would say pretty brave overall too. Especially like being nice to uh, Edie in in a situation where I just don't see a lot of people being nice. I don't know if nice is the word I would use, though. I don't well, know. I mean, like, at least accepting of the situation and being, like, oddly kind with her, even though there's always this undercurrent of, like, yeah. you know. And again, her she's, she's pretty scant in her interiority. Yeah. Not that we but, ever leave Edie's, but it's just, like, she is fucking and dating and with Eric way more, so you just get more of a sense of him. Yeah. But I, I do think there's some Hufflepuff, Hufflepuffness to her, too. I mean, she's staying with Eric out of... I just, I just don't That's know. That's true. That's confusing. Yeah. True. I yeah. actually don't know why she's with the dude. Like, did she just realize that he's a psychopathic dickhead when he started to <laughs> want to open a relationship, even though they've been together for 14 <laughs> years? It's like, come on. Right. And you have picked up on that before? So I, it's just confusing to me that this, like, strong, pretty cool-seeming woman is with this douche. So. She describes her courtship with Eric very briefly in the book mm-hmm. as her dating, her herself dating, like, it's weird. It's like she was actually dating, like, pieces of shit, like metal dudes and stuff who then all ended up working in Wall Street. And she said Eric was actually the most genuine seeming, I guess, guy, like, very, like, seemingly just nice. It's just one of those things, like, it, it felt like the relationship, again, I wanted more of this kind of thing, like, Bad boys, and then yeah. she, she a nice guy. It's just a change of pace. It's just, that's who she marries. I'm gonna go with Ravenclaw, and I'm n- not taking any questions. Okay. I think I bec- did... because she's so like she wants. She's very you know her life is very orderly. Like she's very like has rules, and she's very like concerned about like following the rules, and she has a regimented like life and whatever. So to me, that's Ravenclaw. And you know what? I'm gonna too. I'm gonna change mine to Ravenclaw too because you're right. That the the rationale for her stay, staying with Eric, it's order, baby. It's 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 mostly just order and and stability. So yeah, yeah. but also okay. an openness to what he wants in this new experience. Yeah. But only to, only to appease Hufflepuff. him, which is awful. <laughs> yeah, but I, I think I'll I'll just say Ravenclaw too. <laughs> wow, we're okay. all agreeing. I think that's. Do we? I don't really know what to say about Aquila. She's a child, yeah. so I don't yeah. know. Which those are the ones that are sorted in Harry Potter. But she's literally the age of the it's sorting hats. To, yeah, powers. I don't feel comfortable. Uh, uh, she's to be to be just TBD. Ravenclaw I mean, probably. The sorting hat is like a magical thing that gets into your. Brain I know. And, we we can't just, do that. And, yeah, I want a novel about the sorting out hat. Your, uh, your middle Harry Potter Potter. count. <laughs> It should be called Potter's hair. Oh god! And it's the sorting hat. What it feels the moment it, it alights on his head. A dear listener, I just want you to know this is the one episode that none of us have been drunk so far, and we we we're, we're, we're a bunch of drooling. And we hogs. could totally sound like it. No, shut up, dude. I'm I'm so sober, and I've never felt more alive. I've never felt more alive, dude. <laughs> anyway, no, Potter's, don't do that, but Potter's hair. Um. All right, should, let, should, <laughs> Yeah, you like it, Paul. Now that you finally you like it, Potter's paid attention hair. to what I'm I'm trying to say here. All right, it's let's 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 score this bad boy. All right, all right. Or this bad girl. That's right. Because yeah, she's yeah. kind of bad in the book, but they she's hate to see a but, girl winning. Yeah, that's facts. Okay, Paul, you got to go last. Uh, I'll just go first. I feel like because I go first least often, and um, yeah. Pretty middle of the road for me. Uh, I didn't hate it. I, you know, I think we've described a good, a good, did a good job describing the things we liked and the things we didn't like. I, I you know, it's like a, it's like a, it's like a low, mid to low twos. It's like a two point two probably for me, something like that, somewhere in that range. Two point two, two point three. Maybe I'll go two point two seven. Yeah, <laughs> that's funny. Nice. I was gonna say two point three. Damn. Um, yeah, pretty. F- uh, yeah, just just meh, like a a. a it felt more like a, a a salacious beach read or something that you could <laughs> you could kind of tear through, but yeah. Overall, just yeah, I don't know. I won't harp on it. Just kind of m- m- not a lot of there for me. Would yeah. Well, when you're done, Paul, I have a question. Uh, 
my, the most positive thing I wrote down in my notes was, at its best, it's a blatant, honest depiction of a woman's experience in pre-COVID Tinder fight America in an eye-opening opening read for some men, potentially. It's good. I think it's, I think it's a good thing for a man to read in, in this co- uh, Tinderized America, too. It's just like you're experiencing a story about dating and whatever, sex, from a different perspective. From a female's perspective, and it's important. I think it that was the probably the best thing about the book for me. But um, I'm a, I'm right there with you though. I think I'm like a two point one five overall. I just didn't really find the the writing to be that good. So it's just, I it, yeah, I don't know. It's just maybe millennial literature is the best way to describe it. But as we've been, I think, referencing, like it occurs through time. It's just uh, people are having a bad time in the current moment and it's like stories about the fucking malaise that just follows every population throughout history you know what i mean and it's just like i guess it's just over overdone and overall in its own way a somewhat reductive it's like deceptively reductive because you're 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 describing and trying to diagnose all of these all these issues um but but ultimately you're just kind of touching on them. Mm-hmm. You're it's like reference in lieu of depth. Like again, another millennial fucking problem. Right, right? that's the thing. Yeah, that right. Mm-hmm. It's maybe like I think you said this earlier, Matt. Maybe this is like a p- potentially a valuable document about millennial experience, but that doesn't always necessarily make for good literature. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. Yeah. yeah. I think that's a good way to sum it up for me too. I was thinking along those same same lines. Yep. All right. Well, happy Sunday afternoon from yes. from the brunch brunch uh, edition, the brunch boys. Brunch boys. <laughs> brunch yeah. brunch boys. And uh, go check out our Patreon, patreon.com dot com slash spinecrackers YouTube. Yeah, become a reading rainbow or a girl. That's right. That's reading right. Rain girl. And thanks again so much for joining us. And we love you. We love you. And we're in love with you. (laughs) 